evaluation now when it comes to the question of evaluation you might have already got some potential clues on the other evaluation you would have done for ulcers right so when you subject the patient for endoscopy you might have already noted that patient has mainly in the body part or the corpus part thick tortuous mucosal folds because of the parietal cell hyperplasia as well as ecl like cell hyperplasia right so don't just jump to the conclusion whenever you see patients with thick tortuous mucosal folds to assume that it is secondary to menetrias disease the, the causes for such thick tortuous mucosal folds are plenty right so mostly the first thing we should be suspecting is increased gastrin levels right only after you have ruled that out you will be thinking of menetrias disease and in fact in the in the way this disease is present is so different patients with menetrias disease would be presenting in the form of failure to thrive early on right and later they would be presenting with anasarca because it is a pro protein losing gastropathy here patients would be presenting with recurrent ulcers right okay so in this image you can see there is thick tortuous mucosal folds in the image one you can see there is quite extensive uh, barrett's esophagus this is actually a esophageal image and you can see that there is extensive barrett's uh, changes present in the image two you can see that there is thick tortuous mucosal folds in the third image image c you can see multiple duodenal ulcers right? there are multiple duodenal ulcers again one more reason for suspicion and when the same patient was subjected through endoscopy you can see that the thick tortuous mucosal folds are also evident on the endoscopic ultrasound eu has clearly picked up this thick tortuous mucosal folds same thing you could have also appreciated on other modes of Im uh, imaging including ultrasound sometimes with the experienced radiologist or maybe if you have done the barium studies you could have appreciated the thick tortuous mucosal folds and in the next image the same patient you can appreciate a pancreatic tumor right a lesion in the pancreas mainly the head part of the pancreas so that explains the whole thing it looks like zollinger ellison syndrome now right okay so you will have probably some additional pointers to suspect zollinger ellison syndrome especially stemming from the endoscopy so on endoscopy as i have already told you you might notice multiple unusual ulcers plus that would be a pointer then you would have seen the patient may be having tortuous thick mucosal folds these mucosal folds will be mainly on the body part because that is where we see the parietal cells right okay then if you had done the endoscopic ultrasound you could have appreciated the same findings and it would have also identified the tumors now when it comes to endoscopic ultrasound we have to remember endoscopic ultrasound is not very sensitive for detection of the tumors which are present in the duodenum which is more common in the men, men syndrome right men one type so this is more sensitive in detecting tumors which are present in the pancreas like we had seen in the previous image right so this is quite sensitive and it can be considered as a early in investigation or initial choice when you are suspecting a pancreatic tumor but when you are suspecting duodenal tumor it loses the sensitivity probably you have to go with other imaging modalities okay so that is one now comes the confirmation of so these are all potential clues right so with this we are not concluding to the diagnosis of zollinger ellison syndrome so for confirmation we have to follow a very methodical approach the initial investigation of choice for confirmation or screening is or you can just call it a screening test is to do fasting serum gastrin levels right what we are doing fasting serum gastrin levels now when the fasting serum gastrin levels are done it is also recommended that it should be coupled with your gastric ph that mainly to differentiate between the other conditions where the serum gastrin levels may be elevated for example in chronic atrophic gastritis secondary to h pylori or autoimmune gastritis you might have gastrin levels which is secondary to atrophy and achlorhydria the gastrin levels are increased right so if you just depend on the serum gastrin levels then maybe you are just misdiagnosing the patients right okay so for that reason you will be doing a fasting gastrin levels and gastric acid ph when it is less than 2 it is more in favor of the diagnosis of zollinger ellison syndrome when the fasting serum gastrin levels are appropriate usually elevated usually elevated more than 10 times the upper limit of normal for most conventional labs then upper limit of normal is 100 picogram per ml right so when it is more than 100 picograms per ml then it is abnormal and when it is more than 10 times the upper limit of normal that means 1000 plus is where you would be strongly considering the patient as having zollinger ellison syndrome so when you do this fasting serum gastrin level coupled with patient's uh, gastric ph less than 2 if as i told you if it is more than 1000 picogram per ml in that case 
your diagnosis of Zollinger Ellison syndrome is established. You don't need to do any further evaluation. Diagnosis is this, and the next step would be to localize the tumor. Where is the tumor present? On the other hand, when it is less than 100 nanograms, sorry, picograms per ml, in that case, Zollinger Ellison syndrome is unlikely. But again, remember, when you have a very strong suspicion of Zollinger Ellison syndrome, it is always wise to consider basal acid output and also basal acid output to maximal acid output ratio. If the basal to maximal acid output ratio is more than 0.6, that means the basal acid output is, is more than 60% of the maximal acid output uh, and the basal acid output overall is more than 15 milli equivalents per hour, your suspicion of Zollinger Ellison syndrome still persists. Right? So you have to remember that point. But otherwise, the only less than 1% of cases will fit into this picture. So you can say uh, at the outset, it kind of rules out. Right now, when you have this gastrin levels, the fasting serum gastrin levels in the range of 100 to 1000 picograms per ml, that is where you have to think of further evaluation. So, what is our further evaluation? We have to do a secretin stimulation test. Secretin stimulation test. And when we do the secretin stimulation test, what are we expecting? If patient has gastrinoma, this secretin will increase the gastrin production. So, if the gastrin increases by more than 120 picograms per ml, right? If the gastrin increases by more than 125 picograms per ml after we have given the secretin, then you you come to the diagnosis of Zollinger Ellison syndrome, right? So then it is just. If not, again the just is unlikely. You have to look for other causes for gastrinemia, right? Hypergastrinemia. You have to look for other causes. So when it is increasing by more than 120, fair. Your diagnosis. You can be still considering it as just. So, if it is like say 50 or 60 picograms rise over its previous reading, the baseline reading, then you will be looking for alternative causes. But again, remember whenever you are having a strong suspicion because of the other features, for example, someone presenting with diarrhea, refractory peptic ulcers, strong picture, or you already know that the patient is a men one patient and uh, the suspicion is quite strong in that case, and in such situations, if you land up in a, in a situation where this gastrin levels and the further steps are not fitting into the picture, you have to still go ahead and look for the basal acid output and the basal to MAO ratio. Okay, so I hope that is clear. Now, this is what I picked up from the Schlesinger and Fortran, which clearly shows the flowchart that we just discussed. So, symptoms such as those of peptic ulcer disease, CVR, GRD, or chronic diarrhea. Signs as prominent gastric folds, we were discussing about it on endoscopy. These are all important pointers to suspect that patient may be having Zollinger Ellison syndrome. Once it is suspected, they, the book also mentioned that we should exclude retained antrum syndrome in those patients who had undergone surgery. And if the antrum to some extent if it is retained, maybe that is producing the acid. So, in that case, uh, Zollinger Ellison syndrome doesn't come into picture first. You have to rule that. Out. But most cases, it, we are not talking about surgery because surgery is not initially performed for peptic ulcers, right? So, you are evaluating the patient for Zollinger Ellison syndrome before he goes for surgery, right? Okay, then you will be measuring the serum fasting, uh, fasting gastrin levels. Now, if the serum fasting gastrin level is elevated, right? If it is elevated with the pH less than 2, then 10 fold elevation just is directly diagnosed. Gastrin level normal just is unlikely and 1 to 9.9 fold that is what I was talking about 100 to 1000 range just is unlikely but still if suspicion is present you have to go with the screening test. Okay. Now when the fasting gastrin level is not elevated obviously in that case the just is un unlikely but as I have already told you if strong clinical suspicion you have to still go with the screening test right. So that makes it clear. Now this approach has some challenges. What are the challenges? So, the challenge number one is inability to get the fasting gastrin levels done. Okay, that is a second thing. Nowadays, it is readily available. We can get this test done. So, we are not much worried about that. The challenge number two is very, very common. That patient may be already on PPIs or H2 blockers because of their peptic symptoms or dyspepsia. Right. So, we have a very low threshold for starting PPIs these days. And someone would have already started a reasonably high dose of PPIs before they come to us. So, they are on PPIs now and this PPI will that influence our fasting gastrin level test and the acid pH estimation obviously yes right. So, we have to stop those drugs. So, PPIs should be stopped for 7 days before you do the fasting gastrin level as well as gastric pH estimation and your H2 blockers should be stopped for 48 hours a minimum of 48 hours. I hope that point is clear right. So, H2 blockers we are stopping for 48 hours PPIs for 7 days 
and these are two potential MCQ points. Okay. Now, if that is clear, there is one more scenario where again we have to address it. If at all we are unable to stop the PPIs, patients are so dependent on PPIs, the moment you stop, their symptoms are extremely worsening and stopping the PPIs for seven days is like practically not possible. In that case, what can we do? Right. So for that, right now it's a consensus statement which says that in patients who PPIs cannot be stopped, if there is increased serum gastrin levels and if there is history of current or recent peptic ulcer history present and you can look at the improvement of diarrhea with PPI therapy. If you can prove the third point, this point we are already clear, right? That is what made us to suspect the case as Zollinger Ellison syndrome. If you can prove that patients' diarrhea symptoms are improving with PPI therapy, that is an anticipated uh, observation, an anticipated change. When you start PPIs, parietal cell hydrochloric acid output reduces, so chloride output reduces, water output reduces, right? And thus, even even a slight improvement in the mucosal integrity of the duodenum malabsorption starts improving down. So, diarrhea eventually will start coming down with PPI therapy and that can also be taken as a diagnostic clue, right. So, this is a consensus statement. It says that if the gastrin levels are elevated and if there is history of current or recent peptic ulcer and if your diarrhea improves with PPI therapy, you can still consider diagnosis zollinger ellison syndrome. In situation where you are unable to stop PPIs and from this point, you will start looking for tumor localization. Okay, so I have, I hope I have made that clear, right? So this is very, very important for us to understand. Okay, so diagnostic workup is clear. Now comes the question of tumor localization. Subscribe and press the bell icon so you never miss an update from Prep Ladder.